Hey everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics, and continuing our series of short videos on RDS fundamentals, we're going to talk about how the RDS on the handgun can improve your grip. I've done a video specifically on grip in the past, you can find it on the channel. However, I wanted to do a series of videos that just address the fundamentals as applied to red dots on handguns, because red dots on handguns are becoming way more popular than they were, you know, even three years ago, but going back even further than that. So if you're dot curious or you've got a red dot handgun, we need to be able to learn how to read what the red dot is telling us and in the specific case of grip, how that red dot's behavior can help us improve our overall performance. This is a very controversial topic because there's a lot of different opinions out there on what constitutes a good grip. And if you're shooting inaccurately, meaning your bullets aren't striking exactly where you want them to strike at any distance, there's a lot of different wives tales uh, and snake oil out there on how to improve your accuracy in regards to grip. And usually the first pe place people want to look, because that's what their father told them and their grandfather told them and that person was told incorrectly as well, is they want to look at the trigger finger and they want to look at how the trigger finger is affecting the accuracy. And while trigger finger can be a contributing factor to inaccuracy or, or inefficiency, it's not the first place we want to look because we got to think about the actual process that's taking place. If, you, if your trigger finger is causing accuracy issues, the first place you should look is the grip, because that one little finger is not going to, not should not be able to overpower nine other fingers, two hands, two forearms, two biceps, two triceps, shoulder muscles, back muscles, all the other muscle groups that are involved in the grip itself. So if we have the gun gripped correctly, the trigger finger should be the least likely cause of our inaccuracy. And another thing we have to think about is, when grip is actually a factor uh, in the delivery of a round. If you look at high-speed video of handguns being shot, one of the first things you're probably going to notice is the gun's recoil does not actually begin until the bullet has left the barrel. And this is a very important fact because it shows us whatever we were doing as the bullet was fired, as the bullet leaves the barrel, is actually the cause of the inaccuracy. So the gun was pointed where it shot, when the round left the gun, which means the mistake happened pre-ignition, which is very important. So just a quick demonstration of kind of what I'm talking about. Do I need a good grip to shoot accurately? No, I'm gonna use the worst grip possible in this quick little demonstration and do 10 rounds. And I'm gonna shoot using the worst grip I possibly can while still being able to hold the gun while it's fired. So that was 10 rounds, basically using the web of my thumb and my index finger to maintain a grip on the gun, shooting a target. And granted, I wasn't super far away, um, but I was still able to maintain a pretty reasonable degree of accuracy and a pretty reasonable cadence of fire with the worst possible grip I could have. So grip is not necessarily a factor for accuracy. I can be very accurate as long as my other fundamentals are doing their job. In that situation, the trigger press should have been a much more contributing factor because my grip was so weak, but I was still able to shoot really well. So what kind of grip do we want to have? And how do we use the RDS to diagnose if we're having problems with our grip? Well, to answer the first question, the grip we should have should apply inward pressure linear pressure and downward pressure for recoil mitigation. That's more important up close. As we start to move back, my grip is gonna change slightly and my trigger technique is gonna change slightly based on distance, which sometimes make people scratch their head. And then I remind them that they probably have 19 or 20 different grips that they'll use for the rifle based on what they're doing with it. There's no reason why the handgun can't be different based on what we're using it for. So my general default grip, uh, slight bend in the elbows to give me that inward pressure. With my primary hand, I drive forward with my thumb versus using a squeeze grip, and this is something I've addressed in a grip video before, because that gives me linear pressure. I get full uniform pressure on the front strap, and it pulls my hand tightly into the back strap just based on the physiology and the way the hand works when I do the driving motion with that thumb. It's almost, if you want to think about it, it's like I'm trying to touch the front of the gun with my thumb, even though it's impossible. It's the motion of that uh, action that creates a more uniform grip for me. Some people don't appreciate that grip as much two-handed shooting, but when they shoot one-handed, I see a lot of light bulbs go off. 
As far as downward pressure goes, I use my support side thumb mainly. On polymer frame guns, the frame is usually wider than the slide, so it gives you a little bit of a ledge to press down on. Uh, companies like Agency Arms, they machine in a little, a little bit of a wedge or a ledge there, if you will, uh, to give me just a little bit of pressure to apply downward pressure, or a little bit of purchase, I should say, to apply downward pressure. Why is that important? Well, as a human being, I'm not fast enough to apply or loosen pressure as the gun is cycling. I can set myself up for recoil and I can recover from recoil, but as recoil is occurring, and you think about that slow motion video, as the slide starts to come back, I'm just not fast enough as a human being to suddenly torque down more pressure because I'm expecting more pressure from the gun, or more muzzle rise, if you will, from the gun. So whatever I set myself up for before the trigger press is the energy I'm gonna have as the bullet leaves the barrel and recoil begins. So it's important to me to have downward pressure to get my sight pitcher back as quickly as possible. And how I'm able to meter that and how I'm able to correct my grip is based on what I'm seeing the dot do while the gun is cycling. Tracking dot behavior is probably one of the simplest aspects of using an RDS on a handgun. It's something I'm going to isolate. If I'm checking my grip, if I'm doing maintenance or diagnostics on my grip technique, I'm not going to worry about draw stroke to start. I'm just going to isolate shooting the gun. So I'm going to start everything with a sight picture. And I'm going to use a contrasting target. I want something that I can still see and I can still hit, but isn't so busy in its dry triangles and colors and lines and shapes that it distracts from the dot. And if I still find myself later on um, struggling with being able to see exactly what the dot's doing, uh, I'll tape the dot and use occluded shooting so my dominant eye only sees the dot's behavior. The dot is going to tell me what the gun is doing during recoil. What I'm looking for is a bouncing ball. I want the dot to travel up. I don't want it to leave the window, especially with two-handed shooting. And I want it to come down and settle roughly where it started from. Now, if you remember from the sight picture video we saw in, in heat mapping, how sometimes the dot goes below our desired point of aim. And that's based on timing and based on the time it takes the, for the signal to go from our brain to our trigger finger to say, hey, go, go bullet, go. By the time that happens, sometimes the dot has traveled below and it's way back up because we're human beings, we're not machines. Sometimes we do apply a little bit too much pressure and we drive the muzzle into a negative position. Uh, and the gun will naturally, hopefully, come back up to where we're looking and we want where we want our bullet to go next. Um, if the dot has a line of departure, slightly left, slightly right, not that really, not really that big of a deal, but it's something we want to pay attention to. Because the RDS allows us to see it throughout the cycle of fire, uh, even if the dot leaves the window, if maybe, you, maybe your grip's just not quite there yet and you're still losing the dot during recoil, as long as it's coming back from the same place, if it bounces straight up and comes straight back down, no issue. If the dot is departing drastically to the left or to the right, that is identifying a grip pressure issue. Everyone watching this, and maybe some people personally, or maybe you've just observed, have seen a shooter fire one, maybe two, three, four, five rounds, and then do this. He's made a, what we call milking the grip or correcting the grip. What's happening there is the body loves to be in symmetry. We love that natural symmetry, that homeostasis, if you will. Anytime we're doing something and we're trying to apply equal pressure to a system, or, or a task and the pressure is unequal, our body will just intuitively try to fix that without any real input from us. Some shooters have to be told they're doing it because they don't realize they're doing it. It's not a bad thing. The body's trying to do what you're asking it to do, so it's going to fix that grip really quick because something just wasn't right, something didn't feel right, and it maybe didn't maybe it wasn't so egregious that it rose to the level of consciousness. So that's why those shooters I'm like, hey, you're you're milking your grip, and they're like, did I? No, I didn't. Sometimes guys even have to be filmed and shown the video of like, hey, look, you're doing it. That's a warning sign that our grip pressure is unequal. And it goes with just, I guess, physiology. One arm is going to be stronger than the other one, so we can expect that to happen as you start to develop your skill set. Um, anyone, and I, I use the, the analogy of a tug of war with yourself, one arm should be able to win, but unless you make that conscious decision, you're just going to keep pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling because your body wants to deliver equal pressure. Anything one hand is doing, the other hand wants to do. So that dot is giving us direct feedback of what's wrong with our grip. If I press the shot and the dot bounces to the left or bounces to the right, it's telling me that pressure coming from that direction is not equal to the pressure in the opposite and opposing direction. So, for example, press the shot, the dot bounces to the left. Well, if it bounces to the left, that means there wasn't enough force in that direction to counteract that alteration or that departure 
uh, that aberration, if you will. If it bounces to the right, the opposite is true. So then it gets into an either or question. If the dot bounces extremely to the left, is it because my left hand wasn't applying enough pressure or because my right hand was applying too much pressure? And this is where conscious, I should say, deliberate practice comes into play. So a deliberate practice uh, as a diagnostic tool, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna establish my three common metrics for shooting, time, distance, accuracy. I'm gonna have a standard, I'm gonna have a distance for that standard, a time standard, and I'm gonna have an accuracy standard, A zone, smaller, something like that. And I'm, while I'm shooting, I'm gonna consciously pay attention to one, one step or one process that's going on that I have to do. So if we're just isolating grip and I'm just, I'm starting with, without a draw stroke, I'm just pressing the gun out, what I'm gonna look at consciously is everything that's involved in that. Primary hand pressure, support hand pressure, trigger control. And I may even break it down further than that. Inward pressure, linear pressure, downward pressure for recoil management. And I'm gonna shoot whatever my standard, my time standard, my distance standard, my accuracy standard is. And every time I shoot a string, whatever my round count is, I wanna focus on something different. Consciously check in on it while leaving everything else on autopilot to see what's going on. If the sight picture is too busy, and this is something I see with students, I'm looking through the window, through the dot, at my target. If I have a very contrasting target or there's a lot of light and busyness and, and just distractions on the range, it may be harder for me to track my dot performance. Uh, the eye wants to look at the most interesting thing possible, so that red dot is there, and if the, there's not a lot of contrast or anything really interesting for the eye to look at downrange besides the target you're trying to focus on, you may find yourself focusing on the dot, which is a different problem. Uh, one of the things I can do, and I already mentioned it, is I'll take a piece of blue painter's tape, or I wouldn't recommend masking tape because it kind of leaves a film on the lens of your RDS, but painter's tape, uh, green or blue, I prefer blue. I'm going to put that blue painter's tape on there, and I'm going to use occluded eye shooting, which means the image from my dominant eye and my sports side eye will combine, uh, and I'll be able to see my target. This is also a technique we use to practice if that, that forward lens becomes blocked by some kind of debris, mud, blood, marshmallows, mayonnaise, whatever. Well, in this, in this role, I'm using it as a diagnostic. It allows me to see that departure if it's occurring, that bounce to the left, that bounce to the right, the bounce up to the middle, coming back from the right. Whatever the dot's doing, now it's the only thing that I can see. It's not gonna be confused or it's not gonna be as vague because I'm trying to pay attention to what the dot's doing while not focusing on the dot, while also paying attention to what's going on downrange. So by taking all the other input out of the equation and just allowing me to see the dot, by taping that lens, my feedback is more specific to what I'm trying to do because all I'm doing is isolating what's going on. Now you'll notice I haven't talked a lot about uh, target diagnostics, where the bullet holes are. That's important, but it's the last step of this process. What I want to do is confirm on the target what I'm seeing with the red dot and its behavior. If I go down range and I look at my target and I see I'm shooting slightly to the left, I don't need some wheel chart for that. That wheel chart you see floating around the internet, uh, is incorrectly applied. And if you actually look at the, uh, the origin of that chart, you'll find it comes from bullseye shooting. It doesn't necessarily come from what we're trying to do, and you need a different chart depending on if you're left-handed or right-handed, and it really is only good to diagnose one-handed shooting. Different conversation. We're gonna simplify the process. If I have horizontal deviation in my shot placement, that's grip. Could be trigger, but if it's trigger, it's grip. If I have vertical deviation, that goes back to cadence, that goes back to the visual process, that's most likely timing. I'm breaking the shot in different places as the gun settles. Not really that big of a deal uh, unless you're having it occur at distances. So if I'm shooting cadence, if I'm shooting 0.15, 0 0.20 splits, that's fast, right? Uh, if I'm shooting at my cyclic, however fast I can shoot then that vertical deviation is a little bit more expected because I'm not, a, I'm not a machine, I'm a human being. So I'm gonna break the trigger at different times during that cycle. The horizontal deviation is what we need to worry about because that's gonna become a much more considerable factor as we move further and further and further away from the target. So if, I, if I'm hitting consistently left, I'm, the first place I'm gonna look is my left hand. Whether it's my primary or my support side hand, it doesn't matter. There's a pressure inequality between the two hands and when it comes to grip, we want 100%, 100% on the gun. You want to apply enough force to the gun that when it fires, it moves as little as possible. We want that inward pressure, that linear pressure, and that downward pressure. So while looking at the target and diagnosing based on where the bullet holes are is important, I want to use the target to confirm what I already think is going on. And one of the cool things about the red dot, 
uh, especially at closer distances, is because I stay target focused, I get to see the hits in real time. And if I'm doing deliberate practice, I can start to make corrections and see through a string of fire. If I'm gonna do a 10 round string of fire and the first three rounds hit slightly to the left, I can do a real time correction. And then I wanna memorize what feels right when I see the next round start going exactly where I wanted them to go. This is something you just can't get with iron sights. I was making an attempt to keep these videos really short. Unfortunately, grip is not a topic that I feel like I should responsibly try to do in three or four minutes. And I could have broken it down into 19 or 20 videos, but it's better just to get the whole topic to be able to digest it one single time. Now, there will be more videos in this series, but as far as grips goes, that's the only thing we're gonna address right now. Remember, we're just talking about the fundamentals, so we're not gonna talk about tweaking it. So the big bullet pull points to take away from this is using that speed of light sight picture that we now have instead of iron sights we have the red dot which means we get to see the process as it's occurring versus just kind of being a pedestrian and waiting for the car accident to end to see how everything ends up iron sights are going to come back to you the red dot you get to keep the whole time so you get to see through the arc of travel what exactly is taking place with the gun and we want to use that information if the dot's bouncing in, in a direction that you don't want it to bounce in, there's a pressure inequality there and it's much more simpler to fix. Whereas with iron sights, we generally have to do a lot of target diagnostics and as an instructor, it's an unobservable. I love the red dot from a teaching perspective because it's easier for a student to describe to me what the gun is doing during the cycle of fire. And that's something I didn't get from iron sights. They'd pull the trigger and the sights would come back. Problematic. The last thing that I would suggest when it comes to grip maintenance and, and, and checking on that is this kind of goes back to that heat mapping. If I fire three rounds, I should get a fourth sight picture. We call that follow through. Well, what I want to do is fire those three rounds and wherever that fourth sight picture is, I want to memorize it. Is it where is the gun returning to the point of aim you wanted? If I'm having a grip inequality, that dot is probably going to be pointed in the direction that I need to address. So if I have a, a weak support hand grip, the dot's gonna go in that direction. And I wanna be like, okay, I fired three rounds, there were good hits, but the dot is, is to the right, or the dot is to the left, or wherever the pressure inequality is. Then I'm gonna do three rounds again, look at my four sight picture. Three rounds again, look at my four sight picture and be like, okay, it's consistently in that direction. And that's another avenue we can take or another approach we can take to correcting these problems. I'm Eric Allen with Sage Dynamics, train accordingly.